<laughs> Good morning, playmates. Uh, it's a fine morning here. I hope it's fine with you. And let me give you the headlines we're going to be dealing with. We're going to be dealing with what John Tong has to say about that poll of Alliance voters, about how they feel regarding United Ireland. We're going to be moving to uh, a programme that was on TV uh, last night about the reporting from Northern Ireland in the early years of the Troubles and even before the Troubles. And we're going to have another little look at George Galloway and God knows what else. Pat has probably got hundreds of things teeming in his brain. Have you got your brain teeming, Pat? My brain stopped teeming a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It depends on the time of day, doesn't it? You know, you, you need yeah. to get your brain, give your brain time to limber up. No, 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 no. There's, there are some people who are night people and there's some people who Isn't are morning it? people. Yeah. Who, like yeah. I am definitely a night bird. I come alive about 11 o'clock at night and see in the morning, the brain is just full of fog. You know the way people get up like a lark and go out oh. for a jog? I'm going, good and merciful, Jesus. <laughs> but, uh, like at, at about nine o'clock or half eight, I'm starting my second dream and yeah. just turning over. <laughs> you know, th those people like me, uh, eldest son, my father and my eldest son must have got the same genetic makeup. My father was up at half six, seven o'clock every morning in life, even when he was an old man. My son's the same. He's up at half six, seven. Judah, if I get out of bed at nine o'clock, I think I'm, I think I'm something wrong with me. Well, I'm up early. I get up about half six, say, but uh, it doesn't mean I'm really awake. I'm just stumbling around, you know, boiling the kettle. Uh, and what time do you go to bed at? I go to bed quite early, but I wouldn't close my eyes till, like last night, it was 11 o'clock before I turned off the light. Um, I was, yeah, I wouldn't go to bed. That's later than usual. It'll be more like quarter past uh, 10, you know. Uh, well, I'm usually going to bed at uh, maybe one o'clock. I sit and read for a couple of hours. That's See brilliant. when the house is quiet, I can sit and read. Aye, 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 definitely. Anyway, mm -hmm. let's move to matters of uh, affairs of state. And uh, I did say we would start, did we? Did I say we would start with the uh, Alliance story or did I say with another yeah. one? Yeah, Alliance. Uh, so, John Tong, Professor John Tong of Liverpool University, has done a survey of some kind and he is he, he notes that um, 20 years ago, only one in six Alliance Party members were in favour of Irish unity. And now that figure yeah. has really gone up considerably. And in fact, he says, correct me if I'm wrong now, he says that there are more, there appear to be more um, Alliance Party members in favour of United Ireland than uh, are, would want to remain within the UK. Is that, have I got that right? I, I'm not sure about that. Apparently, it's going to be released. Uh, he wouldn't release them yesterday. I presume you're watching the same program. I was watching the Sunday Politics Show on BBC yeah. yesterday morning. Yeah. John Tong. He said, I think he used the word uh, the word that it was one in six twenty years ago, but he said oh. that it had gone up substantially. He wouldn't reveal the figures because he have to buy the Belfast Telegraph today to see, see the figures. Because yeah. that's it. so he, I presume it was in, in conjunction with the Belfast Telegraph. Hmm. But basically, what he's saying is. Since Brexit, a considerable yeah. cohort of people have joined the Alliance Party, and those people now seem to be much more, uh, um, what we say, agreeable to you now. Remember, yeah. Judy, when I was a young fellow, I remember the Alliance was considered, considered a unionist party with a small U. But mm. now maybe it could be considered a, a unity party with a small U. You well, know, they're, yeah. not, they're not advocating for it, or they're not looking for it, but mm. the, uh, more members... I can't remember her name. Remember, she was a, a maybe a Japanese or Chinese origin. Yes, uh, she Anne, was a, uh, Anne, Anne, um, something. Anne, something. I, I remember a couple of years back. She remember talking about the colony. Uh, and she, uh, she also said she was in favour of United Ireland. <laughs> she was basically shut up. You know, oh, uh, you know, yeah, she was, uh, remember, she was, she was the mayor of Belfast or the deputy mayor of Belfast. She might have been. I can't remember, but she was Lions fan. Uh, uh, but yeah, I remember thinking, Oh, so so a, a part a party that's uh, sort of uh, agnostic on on the uh, whole thing about Irish unity. They weren't agnostic when somebody said they were in favour of it. Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing you see. Uh, the, the people, uh, I don't have any opinion on the union, but then they, 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 by saying that they're saying I'm content in the union. I mean, that's yeah, that's the logic. What do they say when when you when you don't criticize somebody, you're on their side. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. True in a lot of cases. Um, yeah. But then, um, do you attach any importance to this other than that these people who joined after Brexit uh, are more in favour of Irish unity? 
obviously for partly economic, maybe major, uh, for uh, economic reasons. Yeah, dude, I, I'm not 100 percent sure in the sense here because you need to look at what what motivating people. Mm. But I notice a lot of young uh, Protestant people now, they're to totally turned off by the DUP. You know that old sort of. Uh, Ah. It's not just it's the religion thing and the politics thing, you know, that sort of conservative, almost reactionary politics. A lot of it, a lot of young people, too, they look down south, see a place that's far better off, see a place where it's much, much more liberal religious ways, much more uh, 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 liberal in no political ways. Even mm. Andrew Trumbull, remember the rugby international, he did a program uh. that was on BBC. And, uh, you know, he was basically saying he's, his best friends as uh, some guy doing about Munster, a, a former rugby player as well. And Trimble was basically saying a lot of people now have, have sort of moved towards the middle ground. The old, uh, you know, shibboleths about the Republic being Rome ruled and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff was long gone. A lot of young, modern uh, people in, in the unionist community, dude, a lot of them are just middle of the road people and they don't like a lot of what's going on. So dude, I think uh, it's a combination of the South coming a certain direction and the North going in a different direction. Uh -huh. I think too, as well as that, it's got to do with you know, I, I hesitate to say it, but with personality, you know, if the what people who are saying no, not an inch, no surrender, are sort of big and uh, almost intimidating and red faced and a hangover from 30 years ago, you find it hard to warm to the cause, whatever it would be that they are espousing. Yeah. Whereas if you see yeah. other people who are younger, sound more reasonable, pleasant, uh, look like they live in the 21st century, uh, you warm mm. to their cause, regardless regardless of the merits of the cause, you warm to it because they sort of open the gate with their personality. Yeah. So... Well, when you said that, Jim Alistair came to mind. Jim Alistair, I think some of his views would go down well in about 1700s and see <laughs> his, his, his attitude towards all things Irish. Basically, Jim was sort of saying, despite the fact that... Uh, the nationalist community in the majority now, uh, they should have no rights whatsoever to whatever. And the Republicans have no right to remember that they're dead. We should ignore the history of, of the division of this country. Uh, basically, Jim said one time, uh, uh, people have a problem with partition, blame the Republic. They shouldn't have left the UK. <laughs> You're going, good, merciful Jesus. These people, you know, we're an independent island. We yeah. have a right to be independent. Yeah. We, 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 we do not live in Britain. We live on the island of Ireland. And if you yeah. if you're a Democrat and if you believe in a government by the people for the people from the people, yeah, yeah. then you should be a governing yeah. your own for sure. Jim's a very good example of what I was talking about in regard to personality putting you off or putting you on. Um, yeah. Actually, Jim, my experience of, of him is a very civilized man, uh, quite polite and courteous, but he comes across as being crotchety and red faced and angry, uh, and as oh. a result, I think some people are put off by that. I noticed on, oh, I forget what program it was now, it might have been uh, Carruthers' program, the, there was a guy from the DUP and he was young and sort of thin and quiet spoken. And I, I yeah. sort of couldn't quite gel or match the two things because somehow or another, DUP tends to produce guys who are sort of uh, aggressive and bustling. And, and Sam, the Sammy Wilsons. Yes, yeah. yeah, somewhere like that, that model of person. Um um, and I know I'd, I'd fit Gar, uh, Gar, your man, um, Robinson in, in that uh category yeah. as well. What's his first name, Gareth? Gareth, uh, Gavin. Gavin, Gavin Robinson, yeah. He, you know, he's a big sort of lumbering figure. Uh, and I mean, it's not, it's wrong to do, to make decisions on that basis, but it is true that we are affected by mm -hmm. how people look, especially if we're looking at them on the TV. But anyway, do you attach importance to that? Uh, fact that it looks like the the alliance party is being outed or is outing itself by showing that the number of people almost certainly i'm nearly sure he said uh that the overall majority uh wouldn't uh have any particular views but at the same time that far more people now in the alliance party are supporting united ireland or would favor it um you think that's important because wait a minute, at one stage there used to be just two blocks. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, red, um, green and orange. Yeah. Now there's a substantial. What is it? Fifteen, seventeen percent that seem to vote alliance all the time. Yeah. So that's qu quite substantial. And if a majority of that uh, third leg of the stool are pro United Ireland, you know that could make a substantial difference down the road.
because they will probably hold the balance of power. Like right now, Jude, it's very you know uh, the, the the Catholic national majority is a very slight majority. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. but if if it breaks down that the Alliance Party people are, are vote for United Ireland, you see in a border pool. You know, uh, by yeah. the way, Jude, the other thing that came into my head, and I don't uh, don't remember the figures, but you know the way they claim nobody's in favour of this border pool. Was, I think it was, it was last week or the week before there was uh, they did someone down south and someone like fifty seven percent of young people in between eighteen and twenty four are already in favour of United Ireland uh -huh. without even a plan without even uh -huh. anything. So uh -huh. like dude, I don't quite buy this thing, uh, and I'm, let's repeat it for the umpteenth time. If a plan is put out there in regard to health, uh, education, uh, uh, policing, and all the rest of it. For a United Ireland, for a, an all Ireland economy and all the rest, of it, and people get a chance to look at it, I think a substantial number of people would say maybe that's the road we should be going down. I really oh, genuinely believe yeah, that. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, but I wonder if the Alliance Party might have shot themselves in the foot. I'm surprised that Naomi Long allowed them to uh, contribute to this uh, survey that John Tong conducted, because the thing they've always sort of distinguished themselves by is we're not talking about the Constitution. That's not the point. We're talking about bread and butter issues uh, and people coming together as human beings. But now they appear to have, uh, you know, put down their cards and shown at least to a degree what um, people feel about the constitutional question. Uh, uh, Naomi, I heard Naomi Long on the other day. She said, no, she said, yeah, what people feel personally, which is alliance as a party, believes in being a good neighbour, been a good neighbour to our Catholic uh, and been a good neighbor to our Protestant, been a good neighbor to Britain, been a good neighbor uh, to uh, the uh, Republic. Yeah, yeah. And she but, says, and she says, we believe in practical. She says, this thing uh, I know uh, over here, we're constantly hung up about the constitutional issues. She says, when uh, our our schools are falling apart, when you can't get an appointment with the doctor, and you know, it's all this sort of stuff. Hmm. She says, that's the sort of stuff we want to concentrate on. And she says, let the constitutional issue take care of itself. Uh, do you, you don't think that people, some people, will hear her. Uh, now uh, say this and say, yeah, but the fact of the matter is your party, the majority of the one in United Ireland, and there's no way I'm going to vote for it. So there, surely there will yeah, be no, people no, on I, the but age. The, 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 I, but the hardliners are never going to vote for the alliance anyway. Oh, so, well, I'm talking about the yeah. age, Pat. I'm talking about that age. Those people who say, ah, yeah, I'll give it to, to uh, the alliance party my vote. Uh, yeah. And then they hear him saying this stuff, the majority want to be United Ireland. That might be the thing to nudge them back into. UUP or the probably the UUP rather yeah, than yeah right and what's and sure it's possible because I remember the uh, I, I wish I could remember her name uh, the, the we uh, Lance woman, Anna Low Anna Low Anna Low that's it exactly Anna Low Anna Low uh, referred to a colony she referred to that she uh, she had been favoring Ed Ireland Jude she disappeared off the scene with a like snow off a rope. No, and she was one of the, you know, Alliance pointed to her that, uh, that she represented everything that they represent. She was from a different cultural background. She was a different political. She mm. was so sort of acceptable that look at we have put her in as mayor of Belfast or deputy mayor, mm -hmm. whatever it was, and mm -hmm. so on, so on. And then the minute she said what she said, Jude, have you heard of Anna Lou in those last 10 years? No, but I, to be fair, Pat, I think she was on the brink of retiring at that stage. She'd been in the mm. politics for quite some time. Mm. Uh, so, I, well, it might have been that they eased her out as well, but I think she was getting I'm pretty certain they eased her out, Jude, because she yeah. disappeared uh, very quick. I know, I think she might have been on it, but she, she was eased uh, out very, very quickly. Uh, she was a nice woman. I met her one time, and uh, yeah, she was pleasant. But you see, she had a track record. She said the unspeakable. There are things you can say and things you can't say. One of the things you can't say is that this is a colony. This is Britain's first yeah. colony. You can't yeah. say that. You can't say that. Some words you can use against. And I'm sure we'll get it to it. I think his, his name is Ed Williamson, the former Labour guy. He said on um, after George Galloway's uh, election about genocide, and the, the BBC reporter asked him not to use that word in case it offended somebody. I was like, <laughs> oh, God, where did you BBC reporter? Where did you begin? Got, get okay, back, that's get, my get for our second, our second item. And that was that program that was on last night on BBC Four. Uh, you'll get yeah. it in an iPlayer if you haven't seen it. Uh, it was interesting. Yeah. Um, I stayed up beyond my normal bedtime. It was half ten before I went up the stairs. Yeah. Uh, I forgot all about it, Judge. And it was uh, Dennis Tui. Was, well, it, it dealt with a lot of stuff. It was only the last yeah. half hour it got to the north here. But I believe even that was quite interesting. Um, and it did show, actually, the best qualities of the BBC in terms of production values. 
very stylish program. Yeah. The interviews good, images good, just just worked. But the to get to the last half hour, it was this guy Dennis Tui who's from here, and how he was told he, he thought he, he I think he worked in Belfast. He went to London and did yeah. there as a journalist, and then I, he. Uh, what, uh, the opportunity came to report here when the stirring of the troubles, the beginning of the troubles or the, or the uh, civil rights marches. And yeah. he was told, no, he, he, his boss says, no, you're not going. You're not going. And he said, why? And in effect, it was because your background is Catholic. They'll not accept yeah. that. And uh, that was confirmed uh, that, in fact, they didn't. They, they thought he would be, you see, he was a Catholic. So therefore, it would be a bad idea for him to explore the um, gerrymandering going on in Derry. Now, yeah. I square that for me. You know, that he'd be yeah. a Catholic, so you shouldn't allow him to investigate. Uh, you're not allowed to speak. Do, do, uh, believe it or not, I did a, um, a MA years and years ago, and my thesis was exactly this subject. And it was really fascinating stuff. By the way, the, the, there's a woman called Liz uh, Curtis wrote a brilliant book called yeah, Ireland, The Propaganda War. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant, and it's Gone out of print or whatever. But anyway, bottom line, there's a guy called Waldo McGuire. He was the controller of uh, BBC Northern Ireland for uh, an excellent, particularly when the troubles went. Now, apparently, quite a decent man on many, many levels. But anyway, he had complete control of all anything to do with Northern Ireland across the BBC, be it on the on the mainland or Northern Ireland. It was subject to his imprimatur, and uh, if he didn't like it, it didn't go out. Mm -hmm. Alan Wicker was sent over about 1965, 66, 67, somewhere around that. Yeah. Remember the famous Alan Wicker? I do. And he blasted, you know, all these sort of secret things that were, uh, he came over to do three, I think it was three programs. The first one that went out and the unionists went apeshit. Uh, absolutely. The, the, you know, he showed the police running around with guns. There was no police running around with guns. <laughs> and what he got. And he talked about the discrimination and, uh, you know, and uh, what he called it. No Pope here. He showed the slogans on the, uh, 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 East Belfast and all the rest. Of the Unionist government went absolutely ape. The second one, I, I'm not sure if the second one was, the third one was certainly never shown. And Wicker himself said it was, you know, uh, the, the whole thing was, that this. there's this sort of uh, convention that at the, at the Mother of Parliament, there was no, um, absolutely no mention of Northern Ireland. And it was, in fact, a bad form to raise anything about Northern Ireland. And there was a Labour guy, as far as I remember, his name was Paul Rose MP. He, he took an interest in Northern Ireland. In fact, he came over on the first civil rights march in 68 and he broke the convention and the whole thing. And the BBC dude, they hadn't a clue how to respond to all that. They, you know, it was basically uh, the, the uh, what was Waldo McGuire and these guys were up having dinner and having tea with the Orange Order and with the official Unionist Party. They were they, they, they were all members of the same club. And there was this sort of uh, portrayal of Northern Ireland as if it was as British as Finchley and that the Queen could be come to Balmoral. And all. Mm -hmm. But they certainly never showed her. Uh, could she come to uh, West Belfast? Could she come to the Bogside and Derry? Could she come to Strabane? Not a hope in hell, but that was never shown. Well, I think too he was right to, uh, you know, uh, um, emphasise the extent to which, you know, uh, how things were reported. He talked, for example, about when the Bombay Street people were burnt out uh, they were yeah. getting thrown their possessions into the back of lorries, and uh, they, he wasn't allowed to call them the Catholics. He was, had to call them, or even nationalists. He had to call them yeah. the refugees. So yeah. language, even then, well, especially then, was very important. The one quibble, not quibble, uh, serious difference I would have with that report last night, is that it made it sound as if it was way back then. That yeah. was in the late sixties. Now, I spent a lot of time in the BBC in the 80s. And mm -hmm. his thing about how you have it, he held it up as one of the ridiculous things, that if you're going to talk about Derry, you had to say London Derry the first time, and then you could say Derry after that. Exactly, yeah. that was exactly the case all through the 80s and early 90s, maybe more, maybe yeah. up to 1998, mm -hmm. certainly. And I suspect it's still well, I, I think it's still, hold on, dude, that's still the whole story. Yeah, I think it's still, I still obtain. And also there was... um. There was no doubt about it. There were some very nice people, good people, but there was a definite feeling of, how can I describe it, unionism in the building. Yeah. The minute you went in, when the way, who you were going to interview, programs you were going to make, uh, you know, that always had a, a, 
you knew what not to offer. You censored yourself because you knew it wasn't going to get off the ground and you'd probably be out in your ear anyway. And I mean, yeah. talking about being out in your ear, again, the BBC, I, I think it treats its employees, certainly its freelancers, in a very, it always reminds me of On the Waterfront. Do you remember On the Waterfront where the yeah. guy would come out and say, yeah. you're going to work, you're going to work, you're not going to work. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's the way it works in, in the BBC. Um, I, I, I think if, right, if anybody asks, you ask somebody in Belfast today or anywhere in the North, is the BBC an impartial reporter of uh, events? I think they would say, mm, yes, that's what they might say. And some would say yeah. no. Um, so this notion that it was bad in the bad old days, but thank God we've got now to impartiality. That's rubbish. We saw that. If you look at 50, 60 and 70s coverage for the BBC, you know, then the, there's chapter and verse of it by uh, all sorts of sociologists and all that. It reflected the views of the ruling class, the establishment and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jude, there have been some, um, you know, in recent years, but I think it's so obvious now, Jude, that uh, they have a safe ground for them. Now. They, they weren't wanting to, you know, uh, sh you know shake the, the the foundations way back in the 70s. There, now it's safe now, Jude, to bring mm -hmm. out, you know, Ireland, the secret history and all those ones, you know, the way, remember the ones that went out there last year, yeah. all the, uh, the interviews, which were very good, by the way. Uh -huh. You know, just talking to participants uh, who mm -hmm. were involved in the trouble. It was very good. But you, they would have done that in the 1980s. And I just remember the the real lives between Martin McGuinness and yes. Gregory Campbell. Remember yes, the whole remember controversy that? there? No way it was, it was the whole controversy. Martin McGuinness came across as so reasonable. And so mm. and Gregory came across as the hardline person. And that was not the narrative of the BBC. Uh, uh, what it, a sympathetic coverage of a terrorist like Martin McGuinness. Yeah, uh, I remember um, one of the people on the board of the BBC, a woman, uh, she was the wife of the uh, Brian Faulkner, I think. She was Lady, Lady Faulkner. Faulkner. And she sp spoke about uh, McGuinness and said, oh, he can present himself as a cuddly little puppy. But uh, in fact, he would be more like um, a, a vicious fox that would snap your head off. Uh, now, she didn't yeah. use the exact words, but that's the imagery she used. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. that was pretty typical of, of it. And I remember people saying uh, at the time of Real Lives, I remember people saying, uh, oh, pretty ironic, you know, the, these guys who take people's lives and we're on now saying Real Lives. Um, yeah. That that's shows we have slipped. Mm -hmm. There was always a strong union, in my experience, a strong unionist influence. And I'll say this now. Of course, the two main uh, phone-in guys are impartial reporters, are doing a good job. Mm. But they're also from a unionist background. Now, yeah. if, 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 if you were looking at the states and you had a channel mm. and both of the guys who were the presenters on the channel were Republicans, would you be okay with that? You'd say, oh, but these are, these are reasonable yeah. guys. Yeah, totally. I like that. I... What he called? Uh, you can't. Um, I, I'm sure that Nolan and uh, Raleigh would, and rightly so, they claim. Look, we, we just deal with what comes out, and and they can argue that. And I'm not. A, mm -hmm. But you, you're dead right. At the very least, in a divided society, uh, you know, you'd think that for, for the sake of balance, that at least one of the, you know, and, and the, the main sort of, uh, you well, know, you can add to that Mark Carruthers, who also would be from a, a unionist background, and I mean they're uh, all nice people. I, I well. Not all of them, but they're fairly yeah. nice people, most of them. Um, I mean, no, in the, well, they like, are I, from I, I, union, this background, and that would never... I, 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 but here's the thing, I have, to, I have to say, Mark Carollers, to me, I couldn't... Uh, Mark Carollers, uh, as, as, uh, I would say, uh, is one of the most clear-cut. When he's interviewing a, a, a unionist, I sometimes think he's from you know, the bog side, and when he's interviewing a, a, a nationalist, a, 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 it's where he came from, Shankill Road. He's, I remember, uh, he's pretty fair. I remember back in the day, I said to him once, uh, when he was much younger, I, I said, uh, you know, you 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 should maybe punch in a bit harder when you're doing interviews. And he said, oh, no, 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 this is the best way. You know, you do it mildly and you get stuff out of people. You don't confront them. <laughs> He's changed over the years a bit, I think, you know. Uh, he, you know he doesn't probably punch in nearly so much. Of people, that, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. 
But anyway, uh, that, that's the, that's the only fault I would find with that. I think it's well worth watching. It's very entertaining. In fact, the part's not dealing with here, just dealing with the development of the BBC and the various forces at work. Uh, mm. uh, Lord, whatever his name is, Lord Reith, was it? Um, uh, Hi, Reith. One, one of the things he said, Pat, and I'll just deal this for 30 seconds, 60 seconds. One of the things that they said, nothing to do with here, was that the BBC shouldn't just entertain people. It should, it should give them you. stuff that they, not that they necessarily want, but that they really should want. So that they yeah. try to present things like, you know, worthwhile plays, uh, music, uh, God knows what. Now, do mm -hmm. you, what would you subscribe to that or would you not? Would you say, we have got to give people what they, what they want now? Or would you say, we've got to give people uh, what they can actually absorb, pitch your level a wee bit higher? Because people are very interested in that if you do that. I, no, I, no so I think uh, what Reith said was laudable. I really genuinely do. He was saying, right, it's not just entertainment. We've got to sort of try and educate people. And as well as that, lift the tone of debate. And so that's admirable. I, I, I have no problem with that at all. Yeah, I agree completely. And I have very strong feelings about that because so much of the media, uh, especially the tabloids in England, uh, they really do uh, go the entertainment route. I uh, Freddie Starr at my hamster. Aye, and that's, that's, that's yeah. not good, you know. I always think any time I go to, I used to go to West Belfast Talks Back, I was very struck by the appetite that ordinary people had and how well they could talk about local events. If you yeah. give people a forum to talk about stuff, where they don't feel threatened and when they can say their mind. You know, I think people rise to the occasion. And um, I think it's a pity that we, if you check the ratings, they didn't mention this now. If you check the ratings today, I bet you last week, the top of them, the top three will be at least one soap opera. Uh, you yeah. know, it's not, there's nothing wrong with soap operas, but there are other forms of broadcasting that would make more demands on you, let's say. And it's yeah. the same in RTC exactly. as well, like the biggest, Fair City is a big program. Uh, yeah. Uh, perhaps EastEnders and Coronation Street always top the polls. Yeah, yeah. Uh, always, every yeah. time. Okay, let's move on to, um, uh, oh yes, you pogged this item, you said that the Loyalist Com Community Council, um, the LCC, um, are unhappy with the idea that the DUP went back into um, Stormont. Should we be, should we be concerned? Should we? Um, yeah, just, I, I just noticed it was price. in the Belfast Telegraph. I noticed that, uh, that he, he, there was apparently there was a very stormy meeting on Friday, and somewhere in Belfast yeah. uh, involved in the UVF and uh, U, UVF and uh, LVF. Everything. UVA, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, anyway, loyalist paramilitaries, and they anyway after uh, uh, they basically they were not happy with the deal. Uh, with the protocol, but I don't know how much they can do about it anymore or so on. Uh, but the no, I, the only reason I threw it on there, it, 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 it's supposed to show that uh, the protocol, the deal is still churning away and unionism and it's still causing problems and so on. So, uh, but Donaldson seems to have steadied the ship. The 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 uh, a lot of people want this thing to be back up and running. And it seems a lot, uh, a lot of the uh, Bardney people in both communities are sort of saying, "Look, we've had enough of the two years of whatever it is, you know, that we had." Uh, and you no, know, there was what uh, everything just got worse. Dude, the, the lists for hospitals got worse. Uh, the the, the pay, uh, pay of people was falling way behind uh, Britain. Uh, there was all sorts of difficulties, and like dude, even right now when uh, we have got some sort of stability. Even the catching up is going to take several years. Right. Now, I wonder, uh, like, clearly the LCC are not pleased that uh, the DUP have gone mm -hmm. back in. And there are substantial yeah. figures like the old guard of uh, Ian Paisley, Sammy Wilson, uh, Lord Dodds. They are displeased yeah. with going back in. Now, in the next election, will that show? In the, in the Westminster election, in the local elections, do you think that will show that in terms of the DUP's vote? Will it diminish it? No, I don't think so, Jude. I'll, I'll tell you why. I remember uh, remember when the IRA ceasefire some years back. Yeah. Uh, I remember meeting a senior Republican uh, who was totally disillusioned with um, McGinnis and Adams and all the rest. And I said, well, do you know, actually, it's not Sean Fain's only show in town. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't mm -hmm. agree with them. I think the DUP and, uh, you know, where, where do, if, if, if the loyalists go more hardline, it's to their detriment. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's to the detriment of the union, the UK union, that is. Um, George, are you here? Can, can I, we've dealt with, I'm, I'm looking for your views on, remember on Friday and Thursday night, George Galloway, I find it really interesting. George Galloway gets himself elected, right? On Friday, we Rishi goes to the lectern outside 10 Downing Street and said it's beyond alarming that George Galloway has got himself elected, that it's a, a threat to the democracy, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Did you make a number one, George getting elected, but number two, that's sort of way over the top. You see the way I'm framing this debate? Uh, well, you see, Rishi Sunak? <laughs> well, you see, uh, he, he was being interviewed by a guy from Sky, I think. And uh, I, I think he was needled by the fact that this guy was saying that the prime minister says this, the prime minister says this. And he says, well, why? you're not talking about God Almighty. You're talking about, yeah. and he really went to town on him then, you know, a diminished, diminutive figure uh, who's lost all credibility. Uh, I, yeah. And then the guy said, do you not respect the prime minister of the UK? And he says, I despise him. So he almost set it up for him by saying, do you not respect him? And yeah. if you like, I don't think... Um, I don't think um, Galloway lost the head, but he gave him an opportunity to really put the boot in. And uh, when you stop to think about it, um, he, he says that um, the did they did, did, did uh, Sunak say that he uh, he Galloway dismissed the horror of what happened on the seventh uh, October seventh? Well, that's well, that's, ridiculous. You know, that's, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, yeah, but here's the point: I I have come to the conclusion. It's is that a bit rich? From from any Tory to condemn extremism, mm -hmm. Johnson, check out. He, he referred to people as pickaninnies. He mm. referred to people as watermelon smiles. Yeah. He referred to other uh, Muslim women as letter boxes. Mm. He, uh, what he, he, he remember he, Sue, Sue Braverman's uh, sweet dream uh, Rwanda uh, Rwanda policy. Uh, uh, what do you call her? Uh, May Theresa May. Uh, no, the vans went round London warning uh, illegal immigrants and immigrants go home. You know, she said that message had to be toughened up. Mm. Uh, what I got, remember the Windrush scandal where, you know, the people who came over in 1948 were sort of told, no, you're no longer welcome, mm -hmm. and so on. It's all Tory party, you know. So the, I thought it was a bit rich for these people to talk about divisive and racism, divisiveness and racism. Jesus, the, the Tory. But the other thing as well, the people of Rochdale, that both uh, Labour and Tory have refused to come out and uh, condemn what's happening in Gaza and refused to call out right for a ceasefire. George Galloway went up there and got 40% of the vote. Uh, by far, the, it was a stonking great victory. Yeah, as he and pointed out. And three, basically, he, what Rishi was saying is the people of Rochdale haven't the right to vote for the democracy because they disagree with our policy on Gaza. Yeah, he, he pointed out that the three parties that followed him, he had got more votes than all three of them put together, uh, uh, which yeah. is pretty telling and pretty crushing. And he, he he sounded as if he were exaggerating, but he said, um, guess what? Millions and millions and millions of people in this country despise the prime minister. I do not respect the prime minister at all. Now, actually, that's literally true. There are millions and millions and millions. Now, you know, it's not everybody, but it's still millions who do despise mm -hmm. the Tory party and Richie Sunak. Uh, yeah. I, I, I find myself, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say I despise Sunak. I, I just don't think he can do anything with the Tory party. I think they're doomed for the next election anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, Galloway in full stride is a, is a force to be reckoned with. There's no oh, absolutely. You know, I thought it was unbelievable hypocrisy of, uh, of Rishi Sunak to go out to the electorate and warn the electorate. Who, you know, they, a lot of, I think a lot of people in a lot of parts of Britain if the Tories put up a candidate now, uh, in regard to Gaza, the the seventy percent, uh, if I re if I remember correctly, seventy percent of the people of Britain when polled said they wanted a ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire. So far, Starmer and uh, Sunak have gone out of their way for whatever reasons. Do that, I will that I genuinely. Kamala Harris, um, see where getting Kamala Harris, the U.S. Vice President, said yesterday she's calling for she's the first senior person and and Western and the Western world. She mm -hmm. says she wants an immediate ceasefire now. And she, by the way, now that I think on it, I think one of the most absurd and hypocritical things I ever came across was last weekend on Friday or Saturday, the uh, Americans dropping in, uh, dropping aid and, into Gaza from the air. Oh. They, they give the bombs 
to, uh, to Israel to blow them to bits. And then they give uh, sent over a couple of planes with um, food aid for, for the very people that uh, Israel have just bought. The but, absurdity and the, there's it's all sacrilegious it, what they've it, done. It's 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 sickening. It's also ineffectual because if somebody said that you need to have hundreds and hundreds of planes every day dropping stuff to have any real impact on that, you know, sending over a few planes yeah. and dropping a few crates, no, it doesn't yeah. even begin to address the problem. Um, yeah. We're getting near the end now, Pat. So, is there anything important yeah. that we've missed? I, uh, by the way, just a quick one. Go back to revert to, to more domestic. Michelle O'Neill is now the most popular politician on the That's island right. of Ireland by some yes, considerable and, uh, you Do you think the Late Late Show had anything to do with that? <laughs> I don't, well, yes, it wouldn't have done any harm. But uh, the point I would make is that Sinn Féin, Mary Lou, has slipped to the lowest point in popularity. She's only something like 39%, whereas Michal Martin and uh, uh, Leo are both in the 40s in terms of popularity. Uh, the There's a sense that Sinn Féin is not doing well in the South at the moment. Do you think that's true? Yeah. And has it to do with their going to uh, Washington? Yeah, they, they, they've lost. You see, they, they probably haven't gained much. Right, the first thing going to Washington and Gaza. The second yeah, thing was... In a short uh, time, Pat, we're watching they, they, were, talk they, uh, they weren't. They weren't, they weren't sure-footed neither. Up until now, Jude, they haven't had to make choices. They just can protest. Now that thing in Gaza has lost them a lot of their own supporters, and, and particularly people you know on the fringes who would vote Sinn Féin. A lot of the left wing people are saying, saying, "No, this is not the right move." Well, it's funny because I've always all I was quite a few uh, Sinn Féin Ardashes back in the day, and they were always a Palestinian presence there, always. Uh, 